Hello, it's Adam from the Tudor Chest here. In addition to the Tudor Chest, I'm also the director of a historic tour company, Simply Tudor Tours, which I run alongside Sarah Morris, known to many of you as the Tudor Travel Guide. This summer, over a three-month window, we have an online learning experience consisting of seven seminars with leading historians, including Natalie Gruniger, Sandra Fasoli, Nikki Clark, and Sylvia Barbara Soberton, all about some of the lesser-known aspects of Anne Boleyn's life, from her earliest days to her household, connections to witchcraft, and that final letter from the Tower that Anne Boleyn may or may not have written. The Rise and Fall of Anne Boleyn online experience provides an amazing opportunity to get closer to one of history's most fascinating but often elusive figures. To secure your place on the programme, just head to simplytudortours.com. David Smith is King Henry VIII reborn, a 24-year-old former delivery driver from Essex. David, who goes by the name of Sir Loyalheart when he's in character, is now a full-time impersonator of the young King Henry VIII, with a perfect replica of one of Henry VIII's most iconic outfits, from hat all the way down to a very sizable codpiece. David certainly looks the part, but he goes a level deeper and looks to recreate how the king himself would have behaved. David is committed to educating people on the young King Henry, before the bloated tyrant of memory, a young king famed for his affable nature and good looks. David, as the loyal heart, seeks to bring this part of Henry's story back to life and remind us all that at one time, Henry VIII was every bit the king the 16th century had looked for. Welcome back to the Tudor Chess Podcast, episode 35, Life as King Henry VIII with David Smith, aka Sir Loyalheart. Welcome to the Tudor Chess Podcast, David Smith, also known as Sir Loyalheart to many people. How's it going? Yeah, it's going really well, thank you. How are you? I'm really well, thank you. Yeah, very good. So we're here today to talk about your rather unique job as a full-time Henry VIII impersonator. But before we get into a discussion about your job and, and, and some of your opinions, I suppose, about Henry VIII and the work that you do, just a few questions to get to know you a bit better, if that's okay. So can you provide us with a bit of a sort of intro into your background, so where you grew up and what you now do Full time. So uh, my name is David Smith, 24 years of age. Um, I was born in Manchester and I moved down to Essex, Thurrock when I was four or five years old. And um, history has been a long life passion of mine and studied the Tudors when I was, um, I think, eight years old and completely hooked on the Tudors from like day dot. And last year I became a historical workshop leader along with a, being a full time Henry VIII impersonator. So I go around the country to various different schools um, and historic sites performing as Henry VIII with an abundance of different other historical characters as well. Nice. So you mentioned that you started studying the Tudors at eight years old. Was there a particular moment that you can recall that sort of really spiked your passion for particularly Tudor history? Yeah, so um, what it was is um, we learned about the Battle of Bosworth and we did like a little reenactment in class. And um, unfortunately for me, I was Richard III, oh. so I ended up dying. <laughs> you know, not the, not the best way to start a topic. But um, the, the thing that hooked me on the Tudors was Hans Holbein's portraiture. Mm. Uh, especially his portrait of Henry VIII, the uh, you know the 1537 Whitehall mural of Henry VIII, you know the one we all recognise. Yeah. And I did my own rendition of that on an A4 piece of paper in you know my art book, and it was a tiny little thing. It mustn't have been no bigger than you know 10 centimeters, you know, full length Henry VIII picture. And I thought it was the best picture in the world. 
<laughs> and after that, I started drawing, you know, I, I really loved looking at pictures in books when I was a child and I started drawing, you know, the different um, monarchs of the Tudor period, different members of the, you know, the Tudor court, you know, and individuals. And along with drawing them, I started reading the texts on the book, in the books. Mm. And around the same time, my aunt took me to the Tower of London where I saw Henry VIII's armour. Um, I can remember vaguely a lady dressed as Anne Boleyn telling me the story of her downfall and execution. And ever since then, I've just, you know, I thought the Tudor period, such a colourful period in history. I have to admit, Holbein is, I think for many of us, he's he's almost like the gateway to the Tudors, isn't it? Yeah, 100%. Without his phenomenal back catalogue, that you know, we, we would not have nearly as much insight into not only how Henry VIII looked, but his wives and the, the wider court. Um, I mean, he truly was. You know, there were well, other painters, but he's obviously the most famous and the and the one that did the most. And it's without his work, we'd uh, we would be we would have a lot less knowledge about a lot of the key figures from Tudor England. Oh, I completely agree. I mean, you know, Hans Holbein, you know, he, he took a spin on Renaissance art, you know, be, you know, Renaissance art was very religious for a long time. Um, and then, you know, a lot of portraiture, uh, you know, especially with it, like English monarchs and, um, you know, nobles, you don't really see a full length picture. You know, I think I can think of, of I can think of a couple of examples, like the um, the coronation picture of Richard II, for example. But the way that Holbein produced a full length image of a king was, you know, th- you know, there was no rivaling that at all. I mean, you know, Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, and you know, and all the great Renaissance arts artists, in my opinion, still doesn't touch Holbein's um, Holbein's work. If you could pick a single moment. To, you can jump in a time machine, you can go back and witness a moment from Tudor history. What would it be? The Field of the Cloth of Gold. Okay. Big. Now, yeah, the, uh, the the Field of the Cloth of Gold, because the one thing that I really, really want to know is whether that wrestling match with Henry VIII ever happened, because the French document it, the English don't. Who's telling the truth? <laughs> well, maybe the fact that the English aren't documenting it tells you something that Henry I, I, did genuinely lose. Yeah, it, you know, um, obviously, Hen- you know, the story goes that Henry was chucked to the floor because, you know, Francis was the um, the better wrestler. But again, you know, it's only documented on, you know, one side of the story, you know, um, with the French documenting it. Obviously, the mm. Edward Hall and uh, different, you know, English chroniclers don't chronicle, uh, you know, include it in their chronicle. I'd love to know if it actually happened and then, you know, see, you know, Henry lose. Yeah. And it would be such a fascinating thing to see as well, because it was quite unique everybody you know anyone who was anyone was there so you'd also be able to get a real snapshot of a sort of, you'd be able to look around and go ah that's charles brandon ah that's you know and yeah. I think that would be incredible to be able to also just see because everyone was there and it would just you know it's that it's, it's like the glastonbury of the of the tudor era you know when when i read about the field of the cloth of gold i think you know on both sides of you know England and France, you know, brought in excess of 6,000 individuals, you know, on both sides of the, you know, talking, you know, over 12,000 people, you know, in this made up palace, you know, that was temporary just for this one occasion, you know, <laughs> it's, um, it's, I mean, I re- recently went to um, the Queen's Gallery at Buckingham Palace to see the Holbein exhibition and they had the painting there. Oh, the painting's phenomenal. I mean, it's not the first time I've seen the painting, but every time you go and look at that painting and you stare at it, there's always something new that pops up. Yeah, one of my favourite things about that painting is the people throwing up. <laughs> I don't know if you spotted that. Yeah, yeah, by the fountain. Yeah. You know, but look, another thing that that painting gives you, it gives you a really good sense of the fashion of the time, you know, and what men and women were wearing. And one of my favourite bits are, um, it's on the right-hand side of the painting, is where Henry is dining with Francis in, a, in the canopy, you know, and then obviously you've got the little wrestling match at the top, and then you've got Henry and his entourage riding into the palace. A phenomenal painting. So I would normally ask a guest, what is a big misconception about Tudor England that they would love to change? But that's going to come across in our discussion about Henry VIII today. So instead, I will ask, do you have a favourite wife of King Henry VIII? 
this is a really difficult question I, and uh, I've been thinking about this all day <laughs> like do I have a favourite wife of Henry VIII now I would say when I was a child Anne Boleyn would definitely be my favourite wife I think she's a fascinating historical figure and you know a phenomenal woman um, but the more I've studied Tudor history the more I've studied you know the individual lives of um, Henry VIII and his wives um, I just find each one of their stories just as fascinating and I would probably say I am drawn between either Catherine of Aragon or Anne Boleyn. Anne Boleyn, for example, is a lot of people overshadow Catherine and Henry's love story. They just see Catherine of Aragon as the wife that got divorced because she couldn't provide an heir. And there's so much more to Catherine and Henry's story, you know, and he's considered to be brutish while married to her. And it wasn't the case at all. I mean, the man gave up hunting when she was pregnant. You know, this was unheard of in, you know, Tudor England and, you know, the Renaissance Europe. You know, Francis I, for example, dragged his wife across a hunting field when she was pregnant. And I think people overlook the fact that they were married for far longer than any of the other five wives combined you know? yeah it's you know 20, 24 years you know uh, when the marriage was annulled and at least 18 of those years were very happy years you are now a full-time henry the eighth impersonator it's a fairly unique sounding job it sounds a lot of fun how did it start out so how did you come to to do this so I started uh, reenacting as Henry VIII back in June tw um, 2021. And um, I started off by buying a costume off of Facebook and then taking a picture of myself wearing it and posting it on Facebook. And um, there was a lady on Facebook on one of the Tudor sites called Gina Clark. And she makes um, historical um, costumes. Mm -hmm. And she said, I really look like Henry VIII. And I reached out to her, not knowing that she made historical outfits um i reached out onto her like business page to see how much an authentic outfit would cost and she said you know i can do that for you um and what's more is if you get in touch with this reenactment group they're looking for a young henry and you would be a perfect fit and i messaged the group they were happy to have me and i went down to pencer's place um on the 19th of june and that's where it all started i mean i look at the pictures now and i think oh my God, what were you wearing? Um, because the outfit that they provided me didn't really, uh, the doublet didn't fit. So I was in a shift and the gown and the hose and it, oh, it looks ridiculous. So yeah, I mean, yeah, you certainly look the part now though. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've put a lot of research and dedication, you know, and invested quite a lot, uh, you know, a lot of money, you know, to be able to portray Henry VIII as authentically as I can. Yeah, did you grow the beard in to, to sort of get into character more, or have you always had a beard? No, no, no. So um, I had my beard before I started as Henry VIII, but I do tweak my beard. So I cut my beard in the fashion of Henry VIII, so quite rounded, quite short. Um, um, I have my hair short. Obviously, you can see my hair is quite short on the sides. So when I have the hat on, you can't see the top knot. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I dye my hair as well. I dye my hair and be a ginger because I'm naturally blonde. Okay. So I want to be, you know, I'm ginger because I'm Henry the Ape, and he was known for being a redhead. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So how did you go about piecing the outfit together? Did you, assuming you spent quite a bit of time researching the construction and then went sort of gave a commission to a, a costume designer yeah so um the outfit that i currently wear is based off of a portrait uh, of henry the eighth by jules von cleves it's my favorite portrait of henry the eighth and quite frankly the most flattering one of him um and it's always been my favorite portrait even more than hans holbein's portrait uh, portrait of henry the mm. eighth and i really really wanted to replicate it and over the time of me reenacting Henry VIII, you know, I'd speak to different people, you know, within the reenactment community. Uh, I reached out to um, Ninja from Tudor Taylor um, and bought her books to read about um, Tudor fashion. Bought the first uh, the first book of fashion by our. Uh, I'm going to say Mateus Schwartz. I'm probably saying that really, really wrong. But, you know, he documents, you know, his life and shows you, you know, for, um, pictures of all of the clothes that he wore throughout his life. Mm -hmm. And I did huge historical research, you know, on the, the garments themselves, how they were constructed, the patterns that were used. A lot of it um, um, being from the Tudor Taylor, her patterns are phenomenal. Yeah, she's and incredible. I, 
She is. Yeah. A lovely, lovely lady as well. I yeah. mean, she's always happy to help, you know, if you're um if you've got concerns, you know, about certain things. Um and I reached out to a lady um who runs a business called Slips and Stays. And I gave her the commission and I asked her, can you replicate this portrait for me? You know, using the pattern from to Taylor. And she constructed it all hand sewn as well. So it was authentically made as well. And when I picked it up and I tried it on, I was the happiest person in the world. <laughs> you felt like the business. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, I wouldn't do a dressing presentation with the like the, the previous outfit. It was an accurate outfit, but this outfit, I did a, pre- a dressing presentation at Gunthorpe Castle last August, you know, running through, you know, what each item was, you know, the symbolism behind each outfit, you know, the idea of trying to, you know, emulate your masculinity as much as possible. Mm. And, you know, you know, it's not just the cod piece that emulates that. The whole thing does that. You know, the Tudors were very much, you know, especially, you know, within the court of Henry VIII and Elizabeth, you know, they were dressing for power. That You know, they were power dressing. Yeah. Well, there was the sumptuary laws as well that, you know, the dictated. Yeah, yeah, the sumptuary laws. I what, mean, you know, what crazy. certain rank could wear. And, and that's that tells you so much about how Henry really wanted to mm. control the the level of access that certain people got to certain fabrics colors what it you know and the fact that purple was restricted purely to the royal family and and members of the clergy and stuff and i think that's really interesting um when we think Mm. about his identity i mean you know the man even put a tax on beards (laughs) (laughs) yeah And and i have to admit the um your comment on the the use van cleave portrait about it being the most flattering i'm in complete agreement i it's actually it's my favourite portrait of Henry. I think it's the one. I don't know. It just seems like it seems realistic. It seems like I'm looking at what Henry looked like. Whereas in some of his other portraits, you can tell there's been a bit of 16th century uh, face tuning or in a, in a way. Whereas that portrait seems to really show. I think that is what he looked like at, at that point. You know. You know. So that por- that portrait, Henry would have been in his early 40s at that point. Um... You know, if it's dated at 1535, he would have been, what, 44? Yeah, so yeah. 44. Uh, I know there's some uh, some people say that he was dated a little bit earlier, maybe 15, 1532. But Jules von Cleves never saw Henry from life. You know, he never came over to England and painted Henry. So th- this is where the suggestion comes, you know, that when Henry was in France with Anne Boleyn, you know, in Calais, trying to gain support from Francis, that Jules von Cleves possibly painted Henry then. And I, I, I agree with you. I believe that picture is a true likeness of Henry VIII. I mean, you can see his facial features. You can see those beady, li- uh, those beady little eyes of his, you know, and they definitely have, you know, the look of authority. The other thing I really love yeah. about the portrait is the quote um, in the scroll um, from the book of Mark. Uh, go, go ye into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I think it's just a statement, you know, that he is that person to preach the word of God and the gospels, you know, being the head of the church by that point. So how long does it actually take you to get into the outfit? And is it comfortable? So the outfit, consi- um, considering all of the parts that go into it, the fact that you are literally tie- tied up, um, I'm tied up at the side of my doublet and then that's pointed to my hose. Um, so you you do get a bit of restrictment, but it is fairly comfortable. And if I'm not rushing and taking my time and I'm, I've got someone to help me get dressed, so I'm all pointed correctly, it takes me about 45 minutes to an hour to get ready. Does it really? That long? Yeah. So that's, you know, putting on the shift, you know, getting the uh, getting the hose on, putting on the garters, making sure all the jewellery's in the right position. You know, I mean, it takes me about 10 minutes, you know, to get me cha- uh, get the chain of office pinned in. <laughs> pinned into mm. the fur you know so it sits perfect because um i won't leave the changing room unless i am perfect <laughs> I, henry the eighth had to do that day in day out you know like that's so much and i and, and for the wives i think it would have taken even longer because you know i think this is a, the thing that people are often confused about with tudor clothing as well and you'll know this much better than me but you know it's it's essentially loads of different pieces that you just pin together and, you know, and that was yeah. why, you know, particularly with women's Tudor clothing, you know, the the sleeve, you could just take a sleeve off and replace it. So, you know, everything was very interchangeable. It was almost like, you know, those 
kids toys where you can sort of dress up a yeah. barbie or a ken or whatever it is and you just pull the head off switch the jacket that kind of thing like tudor clothing was almost like that wasn't it where it was everything was totally separate yeah well i mean that's definitely the uh, that's definitely the best way to describe it you know like a real life uh, barbie doll you know changing clothes in, uh, clothes here and there so for like for a man for example you start off with your linen shirt your shift which everybody you know doesn't matter whether you were rich or poor you would wear a shift very important it was basically your underwear but for Henry, for example, he would wear a shift adorned with black work or gold work or silver work or whatever work, he, you know, embroidery that he wanted on his shift. You know, then he would have his never hose on, which are, you know, stockings effectively. And they would be attached um, to the upper hose via points and held up together by garters. And obviously on his left leg, he would wear the garter of the order of the garter, you know, showing the quote, on Honiswa Quimau Yipont. Um, then you'd have your doublet, which is a tight-fitted jacket. You know, um, earlier doublets are generally laced or you have hook, hook and eyes and they, um, they're they side opening. Later doublets, you know, when we start looking at like the, um, like the Holbein portrait, for example, you start to see either hook and eyes at the front mm. or buttons. And then you um, obviously you have your upper hose, which are pointed to do your doublet. And then you have a jerkin, which is another jacket, but it has pleating, uh, it has box pleated skirts, and then a partening in the centre to allow the codpiece <laughs> to obviously do its thing. <laughs> um, then after that, you'd put on the overgown, which is obviously the big bulky red gown that we all uh, that we're all familiar with, normally lined with mm. some sort of fur, like sable, for example. Then you have obviously all of the jewellery that you would wear, and you know the um, the doublet normally adorned with um, ouches and slashing. Um, his medallion would then go on. You have his chain of office, and then obviously my favourite part of the whole outfit is the hat. I love Henry the Ape's hats. I own three now. <laughs> <laughs> is it hot? I imagine you get quite hot. Oh, it's sweltering. I mean, even in the winter, you know your legs are freezing cold because that you've only got one layer on. But the rest of you, you, you you know, even in the winter, you still sweat buckets. Well, I think that was part, one of the reasons why as well that linen was one of the, because the, the shift is linen, isn't it? And it was because, because it's linen, it doesn't smell in the way that cotton would, which is, an, I think, one of the reasons why it was, linen was chosen was because it, it, it was, it, you, you were less likely to smell bad with linen at the, as the, the sort of the base uh, material. Uh, going back to your question, uh, you know, the question that you normally ask about misconceptions about the Tudor period, you know, let's talk high teens for a minute. Everybody thinks that the Tudors were really dull in colour. They, you know, they stunk, they didn't wash. But your linen, they would change, you know, even if you were poor, you would change your linen and you would keep your linen clean because it was your underwear. And linen is a fantastic material because of its coarseness. It allows you, to, you know, they generally washed in their linen and it would exfoliate all of the dead skin. Henry VIII, for example, you know, in the higher nobility, would change their shifts, you know, upwards four times a day. You know, so, um, but the the clothing that we see Henry wear in his portrait show, it, you know, that, that's him dressed in state. That's not him, that's not his everyday clothing. He would have probably wore, you know, something a lot, you know, more comfortable, you know, and to go about his, you know, day-to-day -day business, he wouldn't have been you know, dressed and pointed, you know, to the magnificence that we see in his portraits. Yeah, I think we tend to take for granted how... I think that we tend to assume that the Tudors weren't as advanced or or clean as, as we... as we, we we don't give them enough credit for that. And no, even no. down to things like, you know, Hampton Court Palace had hot and cold running water. And... You know, and it's just things like that. People assume that would, we imagine that wouldn't have been a thing, but it totally was. Yeah, you know, like you said, Henry VIII had hot and cold running water running in Hampton Court Palace, so he could have a hot bath, you know. Um, and the idea, you know, that they only bathed once a month or once a year or whatever people say, you know, if you ask people to do a survey, how many times a year, or how many times a month do you have a bath? I can guarantee it, and many people would say, well, you know, actually, I don't bath that often because I shower, you know, but because the question's been asked, how many times you, how many times do you bath a month, you know, and that's all you're getting. You don't get the context of why they're only bathing once a month, you know, so 
the two obviously they're not the most hygienic of people i mean the streets of london you know were filled with all sorts of things you know basically open sewage but you know as a people they they were they were clean you know i mean poor people linen was expensive you know linen was expensive for poor people they want to keep that clean they want to preserve that so they're going to keep it clean yeah and that whole one of the other sort of is kind of by extension of that is that this sort of misconception that henry was uh, you know, throwing chicken wings oh. over his shoulders and stuff. But he was actually a very fastidious eater, wasn't he? You know, he's very particular. And yeah, stuff. 100%. I mean, you know, as a boy, he would have been brought up with books of common courtesy, you know. Uh, the most famous one of uh, that Henry had was a book that, uh, a guide that John Skelton gave him, which was Speculum Principis, translates to A First Mirror. And this was a guide on how to behave, you know, to befit your state, status so this idea that henry chucks you know chicken bones and he scoffs his face with food you know and he gets it all over his chin and his fingers that's nonsense absolute mm. nonsense i mean henry the eighth was probably one of the only people in england at the time to eat sweet preserves with a fork you know an invention you know uh, you know an invention that doesn't really hit england until the 17th century <clears throat> you know Henry VIII, he's eating his sweet treats with a fork, you know. His food would have been cut up for him, you know. And they would only, you know, as soon as you cut the meat, that's it, you're taking that piece, you can't put it back, you know, much like how, you know, if you pick something up today, well, that's yours now, you've put your fingers on it, you know. He ate with grace, he ate with decorum, you know, and for the majority of the time, you know, he never, you know, dined with these huge banquets. He was quite reserved and dined, uh, dined privately, but I blame uh, the private life of Henry VIII for the old chicken bone thing. Oh, totally. The Charles Lawton depiction is yeah, yeah, very inaccurate. So talk to me about the job itself. So I imagine sort of each day is quite different and sort of done, assuming you, you visit lots of different historical locations. And then when you're there, you're very much in character as Henry. So David is not, David is removed from the picture. So, um, yeah, 90 percent of the events that I do, I am in character as Henry VIII. So, like you said, David is out of the equation. Completely different personality comes out, you know, uh, because to betray Henry authentically, you know, and to become him, you need to think like him. You need to believe that you are the most important person in the room, you know, that you are king because God has given you that chance he's told you that you are going to be king so that level of arrogance and vanity does shine through when i'm henry the eighth <laughs> you know um and also like he uh, um, if i'm dealing with hecklers i will shut down a heckler you know yeah, any time of the day you know and basically we met you know command the respect that they should show their sovereign um yeah. so my events um can range from going to a historical venue to, for you know just meeting a gr uh, greeting walking around the grounds you know just being a presence um i offer historical talks so i um i gave a historical talk at deal castle uh deal castle in um kent not long ago and that was that was me as david dressed as henry talking through his life and pr primarily um focusing on not the wives but henry as an individual um, I offer presentations such as the dressing presentation, uh, performances of uh, various Tudor dances. Um, in the summer, I'm looking at um, getting like lawn games and Tudor, uh, Tudor entertainment, such as a little archery range for children. So I'll try to make it as fa family friendly as possible um, for, for most places that I go to. So all ages can access the history. Mm. Um, there's some corporate events that I do. So um, for Hatfield House, for example, I'll, I'll, I'll um, stage it, uh, host a Tudor banquet as me as Henry. I'll have nobility there. I'll have, obviously, um, a chosen wife. With, um, the one I did for Hatfield was Anne Boleyn. She visited there in 1534. Um, but we don't. You won't just have like the high table, you know, with all the nobles. We had Will Summers there. We had servants that were serving my food, um, and the food of the high table. And uh, we had musicians there, and all the people behind the background that you won't see through the night. You know, making sure everything is authentic. You know, and it gives people the opportunity to see what it would have been like to dine with Henry VIII. Yeah, because it's also, I think you, you sort of get in everything down to the, sort of the washing of the hand ceremony and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, 
people would wash their, you know, the nobility would wash their own hands in a bowl of rose water. But Henry would have had a personal, you know, obviously server that would pour water onto his hands, you know, so he could wash them. And then obviously be presented a napkin so he could dry his hands. So his hands were washed for him. You know, and then obviously he would take his seat, he would say grace, and then his food would be served. And obviously he would be the first person to be served. And then after that, it would be the queen, and then it would be obviously the nobility, and then it would be the ladies in waiting, etc., etc. And if Emily didn't want food, he would send it away, you know. And any food that was left over would generally go to the servants after the banquet was finished. But I say banquet, it's actually a feast. The banquet is the sweet stuff that comes afterwards. So... I believe you've also now gathered around you a group of six wives as well. Is that is that the case? Yeah, so I've uh, I network work with a lot of um, women that portray the wives. I did an event in Ipswich last year where I did manage to get six wives, and um, you know each an indo- uh, each individual was they were brilliant. Three of them are really good friends of mine. Um, the lady that plays. Um, Catherine of Aragon and Catherine Howard, especially very close with those two. Um, the lady who played Catherine of Aragon, Kristen, her name is, she, um, she's been with me right from the start. So can you talk to us about a couple of the sort of more unusual events you've participated in? I believe you you even got flown to Italy to take part in a, a procession of some description. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and in actual fact, I'm going back there um, in a couple of weeks to take part in the same procession. So... Um, this event in Italy, it's all centred around a um, religious statue of um, the Virgin Mary and baby Jesus. And the statue is known as um, Our Lady of Grace of Ipswich. And the statue itself was the second biggest shrine in England, only that to Walsingham. And Henry VIII paid pilgrimage to the statue in um and Catherine of Aragon, for that matter, um, at various points between 1517 and 1522. Obviously, the Reformation comes and Henry starts dissolving the monasteries. Um, The last record of the um, statue was in 1538 in Thomas Cromwell's inventory, when the statue was commissioned to be burned at Chelsea, along with the, obviously, other religious trinkets and statues and books, um, including the Shrine of Walsingham. And miraculously, it disappears off record for 12 years and it ends up in um, a small province of Rome uh, known as Natino. And um, in 1550, and the uh, the people of Natino um, have reenact the statue coming into their shores every single year. And we take part in that procession as Henry VIII. And I have a good friend of uh, with me um that comes along called phil who portrays cardinal wolsey because obviously he from ipswich and we took part in this parade and till this day still the best event i've ever done that was such a surreal moment walking through you know the t- the town of Latino in italy to be part of this possession you know this p- uh, procession apart from just looking like the young henry the eighth and playing that role to do that job accurately, you need to you need to know Henry's life and his story. And I know a big part of something what you're very passionate about is re-educating people about the young King Henry and that he wasn't always the tyrant of memory. Yeah, hundred percent. Henry the Eighth has fallen into a massive stereotype. You know that he was this obese tyrant. You know that reigned, had six wives, broke with Rome, and that's it. You know, that's a story that we've all been taught in schools, you know, even to this day, you know, when I visit schools, that's what they've been taught, you know. And I find that often most people forget that Henry was a completely different man for the majority of his life. I mean, um, it was really reflective of the, you know, the the stereotypes really reflected of that last 10 year period, you know, with the other, you know, four wives, you know, from Jane Seymour onwards. That he does become that tyrannical monster that we all, that we're all too familiar with, you know. When Henry comes to the throne, uh, to the throne, he's six foot two. He's incredibly athletic. Mm. He's an accomplished uh, sportsman, you know, being an avid jouster, you know, archery. He's an um, he's a talented dancer. He's composing music, and the and he's seventeen years of age, just shy of his eighteenth birthday, and um, he's also considered to be very good looking and handsome. You know, and 
I find people forget this about Henry, you know, that he was a completely different man. And that's what I try to emulate in my portrayal. I try to show people that Henry was once slim. He was once, you know, I'm not saying I'm good, uh, good looking, but good looking. You know, that he wasn't always this old man and obese man and this tyrant. Thomas More, for example, um, talks about his virtues, you know, that he has the, um, I'm going to try and remember the quote now. For what your um, your ancestors' virtues, well, these are yours too. Um, for you have the wisdom of your father and the kindly strength of your mother. You have the knowledge of your paternal grandmother and the noble heart of your mother's father. And sums up Henry straight away, you know, that he's he's noble and chivalric like Edward the Fourth. You know, he has his father's wisdom. I mean, you know, Henry the Seventh again gets a little bit, you know, st- you know, has a bit of a stereotype of being, you know, this um this shrewd uh miser. Yeah, you know, complete um, you know. Um I I read a documentary or uh, um not a documentary, I read a book on Henry the Seventh uh, by Nathan uh, Nathan Arman, brilliant book. Give you a really good insight to Henry the Seventh. But you know, Henry the Seventh was a very wise man. He kept himself on the throne when he was, you know, subject to various different, you know, rebellions and pretenders. You know, Elizabeth of York, you know, she was affable, she was gracious, you know, she, you know, she was pious. Henry adopts all of these qualities, you know, incredibly intelligent, like Margaret Beaufort, you know, Margaret Beaufort, you know, um, protege John Skelton educated Henry for much of his um, childhood, you know, and it, um, these are the, all the things people forget. Then the Venetian ambassador, uh, the Venetian ambassador, um, Sebastian Gustinian, talks about Henry's appearance, you know, that he's above average height, you know, that he's the handsomest potentate I ever saw, uh, set eyes on. Paints a very, very different picture to the Henry VIII that we're familiar with. Yeah, I, I suppose are people often quite surprised when you talk about the earlier stages of Henry's life. Mm. You know, he was also considered to be, um, you know, kind and gentle. Um, Erasmus um, of Rotterdam, you know, a fantastic scholar, you know, of his time. You know, he's championed, um, championed all over Europe, you know, at the time. Um, said said of Henry that he was, um, that the King of England was gentle in debate, acting more like a companion than a king. You know, the, you know, you know, the man, even though he's king, He's your friend. Thomas More saying that when people speak with the King of England, it was like everyone was enjoying his special favour. Yeah, and that's the, the, there's a very, very similar quote about Edward IV, you know, and uh, where mm. someone comments on the fact that Edward IV, when, some, when Edward IV would recognise that someone was shy around him because he was the king, he'd put his arm around them and really sort of encourage them to... Yeah. To, to sort of... Uh, to Yeah, yeah, just sort of calm them down and make them feel comfortable and... I think the one of the big things that just isn't sort of acknowledged enough is just how much Henry VIII was in many, many ways Edward IV reborn. You know, he was his grandfather reborn. So with your, so you're, you're, you're known as Sir Loyalheart. That's your, in some respects, your stage name, I suppose. And it's a name that was associated with Henry in his youth. So what is the background on this name? and What does it sort of represent? So the name's actually um um so the name Sir Loyal Heart is um well Henry would actually say it in French. Um I forgive my bad pronunciation, but it's Monsieur Co uh, Loyal. And um Sir Loyal Heart was his jousting name. It was the name that he would joust under. Um and on the twelfth and thirteenth of February, obviously Henry joins the list in the celebration. Twelfth uh, and thirteenth of February, fifteen eleven, he celebrates um, by jousting um, in the lists for the celebration of his, you know, newly born son Henry, Duke of Cornwall, and he jousts under the name of um, Sir Loyal Heart. You know that he is, you know, Catherine's, you know, loyal heart. You know that his heart will only go to Catherine. You know, so there was this huge thing about you know love and romance, and Henry the Eighth was absolutely besotted by Catherine of Aragon, much like he was besotted um, by Anne Boleyn in later years. You know, um, a few days after the marriage and the coron, uh, you know, a few weeks after the marriage and the coronation, he writes to Ferdinand of Aragon saying that Catherine's, uh, you know. Catherine's attributes and qualities and, you know, are shining through each day even more and more and they're becoming more vibrant 
you know, and that if he was, um, you know, if he was free, he would still choose her. You know, and he reflects on that further later in his uh, later uh, later in the when he's at the legatai on court at Blackfriars. You know that she is a humble woman. You know, and that if the marriage would be good, that he would still choose her to be married. Yeah, whether he's whether that's lip service at the time though, with that in that instance. No, well, yeah, I don't believe that. I don't believe um, that he was um, true by that statement. But when he wrote that letter to Ferdinand of Aragon in his early reign, that was that was definitely true. He meant every word. And um, you can see Henry Jousting on the uh, on the Westminster Roll that was commissioned, you know, to cele- um, celebrate the birth of Henry Duke of Cornwall. And he's there, and he's um, his horse, his mantle is covered in blue. Um, it's blue, and it's got be- uh, beautiful embroidery letters of H and K, you know, Henry and um, Catherine's initials. You know, and the the best thing, uh, the best thing as well is that um, that locket that was discovered uh, by the metal detector it's not long ago you know the heart you know again the pomegranate and the tudor rose entwined with one another it's, it's great when those discoveries are made because we don't actually have many artifacts from tudor england it's crazy but there isn't actually that much so these discoveries are always so exciting i mean i i don't know if um the the locket's on display but as soon as it is i definitely want to, i need to see that it's sort of an extension of of, sort of the whole Sir loyal heart um, persona was that a big part of her and Henry's early reign is the, this notion of a court of chivalry, and I know that you really like to put that into your performance. So, what, what can you tell us? What, what does that actually entail? What was this court of chivalry? You know, what was uh, what was that all about? So Henry VIII, when he was obviously a young king, you know, he certainly wasn't interested with political matters or, you know, dealing with the welfare of England. You know, that fell to um, Thomas Wolsey, who would become his Lord Chancellor in 1515. And, you know, Wolsey basically does every does all of the boring stuff that being king is required to do. And Henry goes out and he dances all day. He rides, you know, wears out several horses. You know, he jousts, he hunts, he sings, you know, he's composing music. Um, for example, some say if you stuff rule, uh, rule if me, a pastime with good company, which is thought to have been written for Henry uh, for Hen- or Catherine of Aragon. You know, and in my portrayal, um, the, the things that I try to um show is that side of henry the eighth um f- for example i practice tudor dancing on uh on a regular basis you know such as um galliards you know to show off henry's you know ability to dance um i'm looking into um being able to compose well not compose music but play past time with good company on the recorder because henry you know he loved the recorder archery so um i, pr- I practice archery every now and then you know because henry was a great art uh, archer but yeah, I try to show all of these, you know, things of, um, you know, all of the qualities that Henry VIII had. Also, his intelligence and the religious side of Henry VIII. You know, if I get into, you know, a discussion about religion at that time, defend the Pope. Not too much, but I'll defend him. <laughs> yeah, this is pre-1530. Well, this is pre-Reformation, isn't it? So It's pre-Reformation, but then in 1515, there was this, uh, Henry spoke to a clerical, uh, clerical di- uh, jurisdiction saying that it's by the sufferance of God that we are King of England. And in past uh, times past, there had never been any other superior to the King of England other than God. So that notion that he was superior, you know, that there was no superior, you know, was floating around in his head as early as 1515. Yeah, I think it's a one. I think one of the biggest misconceptions about Henry VIII, though, is that he was a Protestant, which he absolutely wasn't. You know, it's oh. you know, he died a Catholic, just a Catholic of his own creation in many respects. Yeah, he. You know, what he does is he doesn't, you know, and obviously this is something that I, you know, teach children, you know, and anyone that, you know, starts talking about, you know, the Reformation. Henry does not change the religion. You know, he persecutes, you know, obviously he persecutes Catholics, but he's also persecuting Protestants. I mean, look at Anne Askew, for example, you know, in 1546, yeah. you know, she was tortured because um, they wanted trying to get information on Catherine Parr. You know, and the, you know, obviously her heretical preachings, her heretical books, you know, as they were classed then. Yeah, well, there was a, I can't remember the exact year, but there was a, there was a day where three Catholics were burned and three Protestants were hung, drawn and quartered on the same day for opposing the king's doctrine. 
<laughs> yeah, so you know, both both sides of you know the the Christian religion, you know, the Protestants and the Catholic, you know, both were prosecuted in Henry the Eighth's reign, you know, and it wasn't a matter of what religion you were. If you did not submit to Henry as the supreme head of the Church of England, that was treason, and it, treason, you know, spared no one. It doesn't matter whether you was a man, you was a priest, you was a woman, or you were a child, you would die for it, you know, and. Like you said, you know, Henry was never Protestant. What he does is he breaks from what he sees, you know, from the bondage of Rome, the superiority of Rome. You know, he doesn't believe that he should have, that the Pope should have any jurisdiction in matters of religion in England, you know. And Henry comes across this old law that states that no Englishman should be tried in a foreign court. You know, again, you know, it's the foundations for his break with Rome. He doesn't break with the Catholic faith. He breaks with the Pope. So, final question, what is next for Sir Loyal Heart? I imagine sort of at the moment, every week's quite different, really. Yes, yeah, so um, for, the, for the majority of time, I travel to schools um, f- um, through historic workshops for the company that I do the school work for. Um, but for historic sites, uh, I mean, if you're in the continent in Italy, you can come and see me there. I will be in Latino for the parade on the on the 3rd of May, 4th of May, I think it's the 4th. Um, then after that, I shall be, um, I'll be at Hearst Castle throughout August, um, one of Henry VIII's forts. Um, every Tuesday, you can come see me there. I'll be at Grinthorpe Castle, Michelin Priory. Uh, possibly might have some work with um, Historic Royal Palaces uh, at uh, Exeter Cathedral. Uh, they're doing this project, Henry on tour. Uh, looking at the itinerary of Henry uh, and, you know, looking at the, all the different aspects of Henry VIII's progresses. And I've been invited to Exeter Cathedral on the 13th of June. So you can um, see me there. And, you know, if people, man. You know, if people want to uh, stay updated, um, my um, you can catch me on Facebook at Sir Loyal Heart, uh, the young Henry VIII. Yeah, I was going to ask. Yeah, where where do, where do people find you then across socials? Um, so TikTok, for example, it's at Sir Loyal Heart. Instagram's the same handle at Sir Loyal Heart. Facebook is um, Sir Loyal Heart, the Young Henry the Ape, and um, that's the platform I post more on. Um, so that's where you can find all my events that I might not listed. Oh, Father's Day at Rockingham Castle. There's going to be a joust there, so you know if you're a father, come along. <laughs> and are you getting involved in the joust? No, no, no. No, I need to rest. Is that something you would like to try and learn? I'd love to learn jousting. You know, what, what, I've got so many goals and ambitions being Henry the Eighth that you know, I, I, I basically got a bucket list <laughs> of things yeah. I need to do, um, and jousting is one of them. Having Henry the Eighth's armor replicated and be, you know being trained how to joust and actually participating in a joust would be a phenomenal event. A lot of work. Well, dangerous but although not dangerous in the way that it was back then because you know you'd only be pretending in many respects but um that would be that would definitely add yeah. a flavor to to your performance i imagine well thank you so much for coming on to chat to us today uh, it's been a really interesting episode and, and definitely one that i think people are going to be you know because obviously you, there was a lot of discussion in the press with you like, like last week and i think people are going to be really interested to, yeah. to hear what you've had to say and what your job entails no, thank you for having me on. It's been an absolute pleasure, you know, and I think we've had some brilliant discussions. And so that brings us to the end of this week's episode of the Tudor Chess Podcast. My thanks to David for coming on to the show to discuss his work as the Loyal Heart and all that goes into it. If you enjoy this podcast, then perhaps you would consider becoming an official patron of the channel, for I also release a weekly subscriber-only podcast episode. To access this, just head to patreon.com forward slash the Tudor chest or sign up via Apple Podcasts. Thank you again for listening and speak soon.